Okay, hello and welcome everybody. I'd like to uh, welcome you to the Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment. Um, we'll start with, uh, we have an agenda before us, and we'll start with uh, item one, a prayer, and I'll ask uh, Mr. Thompson to lead us in prayer. Our Creator, we are gathered here today on this on behalf of the people in Northwest Territories, you have given us the opportunity to discuss these important matters that are in front of us that will affect all residents. We pray to you, our Creator, to assist us in hearing and listening to our fellow colleagues as we hopefully make wise decisions. Please give us the wisdom to truthfully come to a decision that will benefit our people. Please grant us peace and understanding to accept and acknowledge our mistakes and grant us the wisdom to be compassionate and understanding leaders. As well, our Creator, please look after our families, friends, and constituents who are back at home, back at home as we work for a better tomorrow. Amen. Thank you. Uh, just a couple uh, points before we get started. Um, for those who are not used to being here, the microphones will be managed for you, so you don't have to turn them off or on. Our uh, technician in the uh, booth there will do that for you. Um, the other couple of things, just as a reminder, is try to limit how much you move the microphone around because this gets the crunching of this here gets picked up quite a bit. And try to avoid clicking of pens. It all gets recorded. Saying that? I'm saying that for you. Yeah. <laughs> all right. uh, we, as I mentioned, we have an agenda before us, the review and adoption of the agenda. Any questions, uh, concerns on the agenda? Seeing none, item three is our declaration of conflicts of interest. Any member have a conflict of interest on the matter before us today? None, seeing none, item four. We have a public briefing from the Worker Safety and Compensation Commission and I'd like to welcome Minister Abernathy and uh, his colleague, commission, or the WSCC colleagues here to present to us today. And uh, maybe before you get started, I'll uh, take the opportunity to have members introduce themselves. And I'll start over here to my far left with Herb. I welcome uh, Herb Nefemag from the NACBU. Welcome, good afternoon, Shane Thompson and Danny McNeely saw two riding. Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. RJ Simpson, Hay River North. I'm Corey Vanthine, MLA for Yellowknife North, and we also have t with us today from Research, Alicia Tumshowitz, and from the Clerk's Office, Michael Ball. And with that, I'll turn it over to the Minister for opening comments and introductions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Before I get started, you'll notice I do not have a clicky pen, just for the record. Uh, I do have a paper clip I can fold and twist. Um, so good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to uh, provide committee with this briefing. Joining me, joining me today is Dave Gund Grundy, who is the President and CEO of the Worker Safety and Compensation Commission. For the remainder of uh, my comments and the presentation, we'll refer to it as the WSCC, uh, just to keep it short. Uh, we also have David Tucker, uh, Chair of the Governing Governance Council of the WSCC, uh, Ashley uh, McAhonick, who is the Chief Governance Officer and Senior Advisor to the President, and of course Susan Laramie, who has taken away my clicky pen and is the Ministerial Special Advisor. Uh, the WSCC is an arm-length government agency responsible for administering the Workers' Compensation Acts, Safety Acts, Explosive Use Act, and the Mine Health and Safety Acts. Uh, as an arm's length government agency, the WSCC possesses legal authority and decision making authority, which includes a board of directors. Uh, the minister's responsibilities include overseeing legislative changes, appointing governance council directors and appeals tribunal members, uh, tabling the WSCC annual reports, and responding to any issues that are brought forward uh, by MLAs and or the public. Uh, the NWT Minister responsible appoints the Workers Advisor, uh, receives, recommends and appoints Governance Council Directors and the NWT Minister is responsible for tabling the annual report in the Legislative Assembly of the Northwest Territories. Uh, the Nunavut Minister is responsible, uh, appoints the Deputy Workers Advisor, uh, receives and recommends two Governance Council Directors representing Nunavut to the Northwest Territories Minister responsible and the Nunavut Minister is responsible for tabling the annual report in the Legislative Assembly of Nunavut. Under the Workers' Compensation Act, the primary responsibilities of the Minister are to ensure members are appointed to the Governance Council to ensure effective operation of the WSCC and to table necessary documents, introduce legislation, and speak to any questions raised in the Legislative Assembly. 
And beyond these roles, Mr. Chair, uh, these roles and responsibilities, the Minister is also has a responsibility, uh, or rather has a limited role in the governance of the WSEC. The primary role of the governance resides with the Governance Council. Um, and I would like to have Mr. David Tucker provide a bit of an overview on the WSCC and the Governance Council, if, if it's okay with the committee. Okay. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Tucker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I, I will be providing a, a high-level overview of how the uh, Workers' Safety and Compensation Commission functions, because uh, historical context is actually relevant to our, our actions. So the Workers' Safety and Compensation Commission, WSCC, has two roles. We have a prevention of harm role and a compensation role. Uh, that role is not a dual jurisdiction in all jurisdictions. Sometimes the prevention of harm, the uh, safety role is separated, but in our case, uh, we have both roles. So for us, it's safety and care, prevention of injury and then care for those that are injured. On the compensation side, uh, our primary role is to protect workers and employers from the financial hardships associated with workplace-related injuries and occupational diseases. We don't fulfill that role all by ourselves. Uh, the workers' advisor is there to help workers um, maneuver through the system. We try to make that as easy as possible, but for those that need some help, there is an independent agency that's available to assist them, uh, and there's also an independent oversight at the other end, the appeals tribunal that looks at decisions we've made. If workers do, do not agree with them, uh, they have another recourse outside of our system. We also have a, re a review committee within the organization that looks at decisions made and uh, assesses them based on feedback from the worker. Uh, the overall system is established based on the Meredith principles. Um, Sir William Meredith was a uh, Chief Justice of, the, of Ontario. Uh, he filed a report with the Ontario Legislature in 1913 that laid the foundation work for workers' compensation boards across the country. And uh, those principles were dubbed the Meredith Principles, and their, their other name is the Historical Compromise. So the system is based on a, a set of principles that trade off the interests and benefits of various groups, employers, government, workers, general public. Um, so in exchange for uh, guaranteed compensation, workers have given up the right to sue. Uh, in exchange for um, shared liability, employers have given up the right to sue as well. Uh, so the, the principles are no-fault compensation. Workers are paid benefits regardless of how the injury had occurred, whether it was their fault or someone else's fault, and the worker and employer waive their right to sue for additional compensation. Uh, there's a security of benefits and independent agency. The WSCC uh, maintains a fund that's always available, protected for, uh, for the worker so that there is a guarantee of compensation in the event of an injury. Collective liability, uh, all employers are collectively and jointly liable to pay the compensation. Uh, so there is no uh, question of ability to pay that enters into the conversation. Um, independent administration, the government does not administer this system. An independent commission administers the system on behalf of employers, workers, and the general public in the interests of the system and only in the interests of the system. Uh, and the exclusive jurisdiction written right into the legislation is exclusive jur jurisdiction in adjudicating claims. Only the WCB can uh, provide compensation insurance. Only the WCB can, uh, WSCC can pay out claims. And their adjudication on what the claims rate is, is final. And those are, are long-held principles since 1913 on which the system was built. Um, our history itself, uh, with, within the NWT in Nunavut, uh, there's been discussion about a compensation system since 1953. Uh, in 1977, the legislation was passed in the Northwest Territories creating the system. In uh, 1999, with the vision, Nunavut passed its own legislation, uh, accepting a portion of the commission. Um, and then in 2008, we changed the name from the Compensation Board to the uh, Workers' Safety and Compensation Commission to reflect the role of, of providing safety enforcement as well. We're the only Workers' Compensation Board in the country that covers multiple jurisdictions. Uh, the overall system is administered by a Governance Council. The Governance Council has seven 
members on it the members represent workers employers and the general public and is headed by a chairperson all of the members are appointed by responsible ministers in each of each of the two jurisdictions the governance council's role is to oversee the 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 functioning of the organization by participating in strategic planning by interacting with the public by interacting with the minister by holding approving policy and by holding the organization to account for the achievement of goals and objectives set out strategic and business plans and finally the WSEC president is the only employee of the governance council it's the mechanism by which the governance council exerts its authority aside from approving policy and strategic plans it oversees the and hires the president and manages the the president's performance and through that way controls the organization so that's a high-level overview of how how the system functions for a more detailed insight into the functioning of the WSEC I would like Dave Grundy if it pleases the committee to say a few words thank you mr. Tucker mr. Grundy thank you mr. chair committee members it's always a pleasure to be able to come before our legislators and talk about WSEC and answer any questions you might have I'm going to talk about the operational side of the WSEC briefly first of all the as mr. Tucker said the governance council oversees the entire board so there's the president and CEO and we have an office in Nunavut so we have a branch off on that we have an internal audit function that is separate from administration to keep it impartial when they're doing internal audits and that reports directly to the governance council as well as administratively to the president we have four different divisions in our organization one being corporate services that looks after our IT HR and things like that our stakeholder services which is the operational arm of the organization they deal with employers claimants and the prevention side of the organization which includes mining and industrial prevention financial services speaks to for itself they look after the finances and executive services is the the where we do our policy we do our corporate planning the review committee resides in our communications unit all of the four units are headed up by a vice president that report directly to the president so responsibility of the WSCC we have four responsibilities to our stakeholders to promote number one promote safe workplaces through education and enforcement to ensure compensation and pensions are awarded and paid in accordance with the rules of entitlement to assess employers fairly and to maintain a financial balance between providing benefits to injured workers while getting ensuring financial sustainability to the to the organ to the to the whole corporation when we go to to the financial consciousness of the organization I just want to take a minute to talk about maintaining the financial balance of the organization by legislation we have to be fully funded and that's right in the act so we're very conscious of that and we're also very conscious that the money we have is not our money it's not government money it's money of the employers have paid in to to fund the system like I said all all employers of the NWT and none of it are required to in law to pay annually their assessments fees based on their annual payroll and also the risk of injury for their industries the higher the risk of interest injury in the industry the higher the fee per hundred dollars of payroll so the territorial government for example they're they're an employer they like it like every other employer pay us assessment rates but that's the only money that we get from the from the government so they're treated as an as an employer not a funding partner financially we're in a very good place and the numbers here reflect our financial straight so for a provisional rate from 214 to 217 you'll see that it's it's dropped by a nickel when we when we talk to employers they're certainly concerned about those what the rate is but they also want stability they don't want to have pay two dollars today and five dollars the next day or next year sort of thing so the two dollar rate is if we only had one rate in the entire organization that's what every employer would be so that's our provisional rate and that's where we that's a starting point when we set rates for all the subclasses 
despite the rate remaining constant, we've been able to increase uh, the Wymere, which is um, year, year's maximum insurable remuneration. So if you look at the, the chart I think that you all have, from 214 it went from 84 to 217, it's up to 90,600. That's the most money that uh, an employee, a worker can get if he's hurt. So if a, if a worker's making over $90,600, the most he can receive in compensation is 90,600. If he's making, if he or she are making under 90,600, then the, rate, the most that they can receive is based on what their actual earnings are. Um, we also ensure that uh, by way of supplementary pension increases, uh, we, uh, we keep our pensioners uh, in line with the Canadian Consumer Price Index. And you can see that's been, in, that's been increasing uh, steadily every year as well. So that ensures that, uh, that um, the cost of living is not uh, running our, our pensioners. Uh, the funded position, you can all see here that we're fully funded from year to year. We, uh, 2012, we were 107 and we're at 117% now. So fully funded, as I mentioned, is a, it's a legislative requirement. So that funded position can change at any time. Um, uh, our investments, if the investment market fell off, then our funded position can change overnight. Um, actuarial changes that we have no control over, for example, there was an actuarial, actuarial change a couple of years ago that we dropped 7% on our funded position and we never spent one cent more or took in one more cent of revenue. Uh, but just that the way the, uh, the, uh, the, fund, the uh, actuarial uh, world is that they make changes and we have to abide. We're audited every year by the OAG to ensure that we're, uh, we're in line with all these changes. And again, any type of a big accident or a big incident where there would be multiple injuries or multiple people that lost their lives, that could, that could affect the position for sure. So our liabilities um, have, to, uh, have to be met by our responsibilities, which we, which we have. Um, so right now, we are, we're in a good position, and uh, we, we want to maintain that for the, for the, um, the duration and for the uh, financial sustainability of the entire system for all our workers and employers. I just want to touch on a second on, um, on our mission, vision, and values. We touched on the compensation side, but on the safety side, our core mandate of the WSCC is, is reflected on our mission, vision, and values. Our ultimate goal is to eliminate workplace diseases and injuries and by working together with stakeholders. The WSCC are not the end all when it comes to accident prevention. It's, a, it's an internal responsibility system that everybody is responsible for. Um, and we want to build support and we want to change cultures in the workplace so that people think safety, not only at the workplace, but when they go home at night, they're always thinking safety as well. So everyone has a legal and moral responsibility to ensure the safety of workers and coworkers. Um, lives lost as a result of place accident or incidents, uh, they're unacceptable because uh, they are preventable. Um, and how do we accomplish this? Again, like I said, it's not through, it's not us doing it, it's work by working with our stakeholders. Uh, we are responsible for administrating and enforcing the Workers' Compensation Acts, Safety Acts, Mine Health and Safety Acts, and the Explosive, Explosive Use Acts. The safety acts and regulations are, are handled by our prevention uh, services side, which is industrial prevention and our mining prevention. Um, we, they, the Prevention Services Division was created in 1996 when the government of the Northwest Territories ruled that prevention side over to the uh, workers' compensation side, uh, and we took uh, full control over that. Before that, it was with the uh, Safety and Public Service Department of the GNWT. Um, the addition of these, uh, these two uh, units, the Mine Safety and Industrial Safety, uh, was one of the reasons why our name has changed, like Mr. Tucker talked about. Um, so the newer name really reflects our safety activities uh, a lot better and what we actually do in addition to our insurance uh, issues as well. Uh, in their role of administering, promoting, and enforcing the safety acts and regulations, prevention services, we go out and we do uh, safety uh, checks, uh, safety inspections on work, uh, work sites, both the NWT and Nunavut. Uh, we, if there are issues, we order corrective actions in the event of unsafe work conditions, and that's to perfect, prevent uh, any accidents or uh, any injuries, uh, and investigate and report on any work-related uh, uh, fatalities or serious injuries or any other dangerous occurrences. Uh, even if no one was injured, we, we, see, we want to make sure no, nobody does get hurt. Uh, we work with um, employers and workers uh, to provide guidance and share best practices uh, with them. And we also work on uh, providing safety education and resources with our partners uh, that we have uh, throughout uh, the NWT and Nunavut. Um, 
So speaking on safety and care, you know, safety is everyone's responsibility. The internal responsibility philosophy behind occupational health and safety legislation is that everybody has to take um, safety as the number one thing when you're on the job site. Um, employers and workers are all alike are re responsible. Just a couple more quick points. Our policy and legislation. Our WSCC policies explain our in internal and external stakeholder responsibilities under the Workers' Compensation Act, Safety Acts, Mine Health and Safety and Safety Acts, and the Explosive Use Acts. The Governance Council, although we we provide them with the documentation, the Governance Council, uh, by way of our comprehensive policy review plan, they direct what policies they need to be looked at. They also approve every policy. Those policies are, um, are drafted by our policy and legislation unit and are, are sent out for consultation uh, at every chance. Uh, there's not one policy goes before the Governance Council that hasn't been um, sent out for uh, consultation with stakeholders, and we have a really uh, robust uh, stakeholder group that responds uh, almost 100% of the time to every policy. Um, on our website, you can also see at any time the policies that are currently under review and the legislation that we're working on uh, dealing with health, uh, workplace health and safety. And like I said, that's all on the website. Uh, it, under legislation, it's our mandate that we look at a policy, we look at legislation, and we, when we see the need, we make recommendations to the minister, who in turn would make recommendations to the government to change or to update or to make those type of things. As in any organization, if you're not active in social media, you're left behind. So we are branching into that area. We're on Twitter, Facebook. We have our own website. Uh, we have a monthly e-newsletter that goes to all employers and that anybody that wants it can sign up for it. Um, and we just recently, within the last month, uh, started a president's blog, or we call it a president's corner, in which the president will discuss uh, up-to-date safety issues or questions that I've been asked or the president has been asked by, by employers or workers. It's a, just another avenue to get out there. So lastly, we are back to the action regulations, and I and I'd said earlier that uh, we only make recommendations and are we're mandated to uh, to make those recommendations to the minister. You may have heard that we are looking at uh, a couple of changes. Number one, the Workers' Compensation Act. I think there's 12 or 14 changes that we're looking at. These are minor changes. Um, some of these are are. Um, Decisions by courts uh, that go against what is written in the act, so they have to be changed to, to deal with the courts. Uh, others are tweaks more than anything. We're also looking at um, a ticketing system under the summary convictions uh, procedures regulations. Uh, right now, the Workers' Compensation Act, the Safety Acts, and all the acts that we administer we have the ability to take people to court uh, if need be. That's the last thing we want to do because we want to work with employers and workers so that we never have to get to court. But in the event that that doesn't work and we end up in court, um, we, we go that route. Uh, a way of uh, circumventing the court would be a ticketing system like a traffic ticket. So if you get caught speeding, you don't have to go to court every time. If you get a parking ticket, you don't have to go to court every time. These tickets are just a mechanism of if you don't have a hard hat on, here's a, here's a, here's a ticket for $200 or whatever the fine would be to wear a hard hat. In all acts and regulations, uh, there's always uh, mechanisms either administratively or by ticketing to find people. Again, that's not what we're in business for is to find people. We're in business to have compliance with the acts and regulations. This just gives us a, a tool that would allow us and make it a little bit more convenient for, for workers and employers rather than going to court um, just to pay it outright. Again, we're in the very early stages of this. We're at public consultation. Um, Works Compensation Act, the public consultation is uh, pretty much all 100% positive. Uh, on the ticketing, it's, uh, it's mixed. Again, there's been no decisions made. What we would be doing uh, once the, it's all done would be drafting up a paper, presenting it to the Governance Council. They will decide, the Governance Council will decide on the merits of what we've done, either to go back out and do more work or to make a recommendation either to nix what we've done or to send it forward to the minister, at which time we would prepare the proper documents and send it over to the minister. So briefly, that's, uh, that's where we are operationally, and I'd like to turn it back over to Minister Abernathy, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you. Minister Abernathy, anything further? We're open to any questions the committee may have. Thank you very much, and thank you for presenting today. <coughs> committee, comments, questions, concerns for our presenters? Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair, and thanks for the presentation. Um, uh, 
I have some questions around the Safe Advantage program. And, uh, your ministers heard these in the House. So, um, when is the next uh, scheduled review of the Safe Advantage program? Thank you. Minister Abernathy. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, the next review of the Safe Advantage Program will be 2018. Further, Mr. O'Reilly? Thanks. Um, yeah, I've had a constituent who's a local contractor uh, get in touch with me. Um, he's gone through the process of getting a core certification and uh, would like to have some sort of recognition of that. Uh, but uh, safe advantage only applies to large employers where their premiums are $40,000 or more. So um, how can we provide a way to uh, recognize uh, core certification as, as a form of a safety program and provide some incentive for uh, smaller employers to do that sort of thing? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Grundy. Thank you. Mr. Abernathy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I think I already answered this question in the House, but uh, I will go to Mr. Grundy now to give a more specific uh, answer to that question. Thank you. Mr. Grundy. Um, you're, you're quite right. Um, the Safe Advantage covers employers with $40,000 in assessments or more. We are currently looking at and have been looking at how we can um, roll in a, a business incentive or a safety incentive for small business. Um, it's very difficult uh, because we are a small organization, uh, small, uh, small territories. Uh, we don't have a lot of businesses. And we've looked at programs that, were, that work in Alberta, work in Saskatchewan, BC, but they are certainly have way more employers than we have. Um, so what we are looking at is, is there a way? Um, I couldn't give you a definitive answer right at this moment. There, there might be a way. Our actuary is concerned that um, it would cost employers more money than the end result would be. Um, there are many safety programs out there, being, CORE being one, and CORE being a very, a very good one that's uh, promoted heavily by one of our partners here in, in the Northwest Territories in Nunavut. So we are looking at that, sir, and um, when we get some definitive answers, we'll certainly let the minister know. Further, Mr. O'Reilly? Uh, thanks. Um, any sort of time frame for that? And can we get a commitment then from the minister to uh, uh, report back to the uh, committee? Thanks. Minister Abernathy. Start with you. Time frame, Mr. Grundy. Uh, the time frame, I think if we, we're looking at uh, Q3 of this year. Uh, we've done some research all throughout last year uh, to 16. So I think Q3 will be able to have a definitive report on uh, a go, no go situation. Thank you. And to the commitment, Minister Abernathy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, following the processes, that information will be provided to the to the board, the the, board, the, the, the chair, and, and the other members of the board, uh, who will then obviously make evidence-based decisions on what information is being presented to them and where they choose to go. I will certainly be willing to share with with committee when we when we have a position. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. I think further. Next, I have Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my, my question is to uh, Mr. Gandhi here on your programs and services that you have available. Um, the, the recently, I'll use for an example, recently in the SATU, starting from 2011, you had a lot of activity going on, but I don't recall seeing the Commission's presence there in saying to the private sector, we're available, this is what you need, this is what we can do as far as implementing uh, safety courses, the standard ones, which are uh, first aid and uh, WEMIS and TDG, for example. H have you got some sort of a schedule to offer services out there for those types of programs to ease the uh, and uh, increase the safety environment for them, the average small business operator? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Grundy. Thank you, sir. Um, yes, we do, and um, we've just recently um, re reclassified a, a couple of positions within the organization to do exactly what you're talking about. We did find in the past that um, the smaller communities, the smaller businesses, for their location, they're harder to reach. Uh, they may not have the um, the availability uh, to our web services that is uh, where we have most of it housed. So we have uh, a position that's uh, an oh &S specialist that will travel um, to any community to speak with small business. And we've had um, um, some 
uh, I guess some courses that we put on. We talked to every SAO in the uh, in the NWT just recently. We had a, um, a meeting with them here and put them through some some training, and they're all aware of where all our courses are. Uh, speaking directly to first aid, uh, that those courses can be accessed through our website, um, and they were all, they're all scheduled. And if there isn't one scheduled for the area you're talking about, it's just a matter of a phone call to our chief safety officer, and we can certainly schedule one one there. And there's parameters around how many people we need and those sort of things. Um, so on the women's side, we are uh, purchasing um, 2,000 seats. Uh, from the uh, from the national organization that controls WIMIS, and that we'll be offering them uh, by the end of this month for free to any business person, any worker that wants to take the course. It's an online course, and it, it only takes a couple hours to do, and it's uh, that'll train them all up in WIMIS. So, if there's, uh, we also have our partners, um, the uh, the. Northern Safety Association, which posts all their courses online and, and where they can be accessed and how they can be accessed, and they're a, they're a valuable part of uh, providing education uh, around the territories as well. Thank you. Further, Mr. McNeely? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. How often uh, throughout a calendar year do you go to the 32 communities? I mean, I, I know you're here, but how often do you make it to, say, Colville Lake, for example? Thank you. Mr. Grundy? Thank you, Mr. Grundy. So there are some communities we probably wouldn't get to uh, throughout the year. Uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, resources, the cost of getting there, and what is going actually on in that in that community. Having said that, though, that uh, if there if there's complaints, we attend all the time. Um, we ensure that uh, our our mandate is to ensure the safety of all workers and employers in the Northwest Territories and Nunavut. So we make a point of trying to get to them at least every two years. Uh, now I'm talking the really small communities. We have two, uh, two employees up in, um, up in Inuvik that, uh, that do all there. We have a number of employees here. And of course, we have employees over in, uh, in uh, Nunavut that uh, do all the Nunavut side and, and some part of the NWT as well. Thank you. Further, Mr. McNeely. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just bring that out for the uh, the improvements on efficiencies, as one of my colleagues like to present to best uh, serve the people that, that we are representing. Thank you. Thank you. That's noted. Further, oh, next on my list, Mr. Thompson. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, on slide 16, you talk about uh, summary conviction process of consulting on ticking process. Uh, could you explain the rationale for developing this? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Minister Abernathy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I will go to uh, Mr. Grunick for some, some of the detail on that. The bottom line is, as, uh, as safety is one of their responsibilities within the WSCC, it's important to be out there trying to find ways to ensure that employees, employers, and work sites are safe. Um, I do believe Mr. Grundy touched on some of the reasons why they're exploring this, but as far as going out and do the, doing the consultation and doing their due diligence, they have prepared a discussion paper which actually follows what a number of other jurisdictions are doing. Pretty much every jurisdiction is doing ticketing in some capacity. The, uh, the document that was prepared was based on a Saskatchewan model. It's purely a discussion item. Uh, it doesn't define what it may look like if it is moved forward in the Northwest Territories. But it was a document that was sent out to encourage discussion, get people talking, get input from, from businesses and employers. Uh, we strongly encourage anybody who's got some comments or concerns to, to get those comments and concerns into the WSCC. Uh, from there, a document with what we've heard will be prepared and it will be sent to the Board of Governors so that they can make an informed decision on whether to pursue this or not pursue this. But for some more specifics, I'll go to Mr. Grundy. Thank you. Mr. Grundy. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Chair. The, um, like the minister said, in every jurisdiction, there's a, there's a mechanism for, for doing, you know, holding people accountable. Some of it's administratively, where you would add, if there's something that happened, you'd add it onto their, the employer's assessments. Um, that's not all that fair because that then doesn't deal with the worker that the employer may have said to a worker, wear your hard hat. And the worker, as soon as the employer's out of the room, puts a hard hat down. So then we walk in and find the worker without a hard hat. Right now, the employer takes the brunt of it. And like I said, safety is everyone's responsibility. So if the employer is doing his due diligence 
and the workers just ignoring that due diligence our mandate is to protect the workers and ensure the employers are providing all the necessary things that they need to do to have a safe workplace so this is just a way of right now we have the ability to take people to court which I say we don't do very often but we when we rarely take workers to court and in my time in 15 years I don't think we've ever taken a worker to court generally by the time it comes to a worker the workers hurt and you know certainly we don't want to do we don't want to inflict any more pain on that worker so this way if we find people that are that are violating the safety act in minor ways they can just have a ticket and that's the reason to move forward in that way we do have the ability to do it now within the act but it's a court ability rather than a ticketing ability thank you further mr. Abernathy and just just as a point there are a number of jurisdictions that are doing picketing now some of them have different rates I know that some of the feedback I've received is the rates that we have proposed are way too high why aren't we looking at Alberta rates just to remind everybody that the documented out is purely a discussion item and it's encouraged it's being sent out to encourage this exact type of conversation to get input from workers from employers so that information to go to the the board the governance council so that they can make informed decisions based on what people in the Northwest Territories are saying what employers and employees are saying but also what's happening in other jurisdictions where it goes I'm certainly waiting to see what the the the, the governance council decides on whether or not this is something that should be pursued or uh, something that it does it is not necessary given that we can take or rather they can take employees to court already even though it's a little clunky and probably would cost more in the long run Thank you. Further, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I thank the Minister and the staff for the answer. <clears throat> My big problem is on looking at this is that you're based out of a new big yellow knife. You try to get into all small communities at least once every two years. Where's the education component that, to me, we need to educate the people properly? And if you're only coming into a community once every two years, there might be a whoops or whatever. And I'm not saying it's wrong, but where's the educational component that should be, to me, is the strong point is the, the that's what we should be looking at. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Minister Abernathy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I will go to uh, Mr. Gurney for some more specifics. But there are a significant amount of resources available through the WSCC online uh, that are free that could be utilized to help develop safety plans or occupational health and safety plans for small businesses, um, things that, that employers need to know. Um, so there are other mechanisms rather than having somebody from WSCC show up in your office and stand in front of you. Uh, the uh, WSCC uh, is clearly committed to making sure that information is out there. It's clearly committed to working with employers to make sure they're putting in effective occupational health and safety plans and is got a priority on safety so there's lots of public information uh, advertising the the president did list the different mechanisms they use to get that information out to employers I, I take your point that you know obviously some employers some communities would like to see them more and I think the the chair of the governor's council hears you and the president hears you uh, but also every time the WSCC spends money that money's got to come from somewhere so we got to make sure that we're taking every effort to get good value for money um, so that we don't have to raise rates for employers of the Northwest Territories but for more specifics I will go to the president if I left him anything to say <laughs> mr. Grundy so like I said we we've created an OHS specialist position that will go to any any uh, community at any time uh, to assist in the development of safety programs we actually have we've developed a, a safety program template that we can give to a to uh, to a community that they just have to fill in all their specific details which will meet the requirements of legislation so that's going to take the burden off uh, uh, the small communities and the smaller businesses because we do realize that it's, it's a, there's an expense to all this if you you may or may not have seen that we're, av we're advertising right now, and I think it's closed for a um, for a position. We re redefined a position within the organization that will develop school-based programs, so that we can move into the uh, to the schools. Because really, if we can educate our kids coming up about safety, uh, about workplace safety, and health safety, then we can that when they go to the workforce, that'll certainly be a lot easier. That development, uh, Newfoundland, Saskatchewan already have courses that are developed. We, they've given the courses to us. We just have to to um, develop them for us, and um, 
and move forward. Also, the Northern Safety Association, which is one of our partners, they have many courses online that you can get at 3,500 or so at a minimal cost. Uh, and then they have the larger courses, of course, that they travel throughout the territories giving these courses on, on, behalf, of, on behalf of us because they have the expertise. Um, so there's, there's a number of ways to get the education. Um, and again, if we, we did educate all the SAOs in the Northwest Territories, uh, just before Christmas, so they had a meeting here in Yellow Life. We were able to spend two days with them uh, about their responsibilities and how we can get all this. So the SAOs are aware, or they should be aware. And uh, we're certainly, I agree with you, Mr. Thompson, that it's, uh, we'd rather educate and assist than have to go investigate accidents or you know, take people to court. Further, Mr. Thompson. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the answer. I guess I'm looking at my, I guess my big challenge right now is you talk about SAOs, they come and go, um, which is a big challenge. I know in my communities, we just got a new one in the community I, I live in right now. So what promotional opportunities are out there that so people are aware of so we can promote this? Because I know right now we have a literacy problem. Sometimes the internet doesn't work that great. So. How are we promoting what you guys are trying to get across? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Grundy? So I talked very briefly, of course, on the social media and on, on my the President's blog now that uh, we'll be discussing these things. Again, and I, I do take your point that sometimes the Internet doesn't, doesn't work that well. We have, uh, we have an e-newsletter, which again goes over the Internet, but if there are specifics that um, a community, the internet doesn't work, we certainly will send anything, paper, uh, whatever they need, we'll go into that community and assess what, what the needs are and then come back and make a plan with that community to, to serve them on whatever they need. I do concur with what you're saying though, Mr. Thompson, that uh, we have some challenges in the north um, and those sort of things. Like I said, we're, we're bought some courses that we're going to give for free um, that will help employers and workers meet the needs of the uh, the the, uh, the acts that we uh, administer, and other than that, um, I think we've touched on everything. Thank you. We have three others. In, okay, great. Next, I have Mr. Nakamayak. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks for the presentation. I won't get into details. Uh, you've answered a few of my questions already. I see uh, in the paper that you have a couple of ads out for a safety advisor, committee member, and, and a public representative. Who chooses these um, these uh, these appointees uh, at the WSCC? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Abernathy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. By way of legislation, the minister responsible has the uh, the authority for for selecting individuals. Uh, we did go out for competition on the workers' advisory position. Uh, we send that application or that, that request out across the Northwest Territories. We've got a large number of applications. I did interview a number of individuals and based on uh, the job requirements, uh, made a selection accordingly. We're currently out for uh, adjudication panel. That should be in the paper shortly, uh, if it isn't already. I believe we have three vacancies coming up on that. Uh, same thing, we are out doing a call. Uh, there are specific requirements that uh, individuals on that panel have to have. Uh, so we will get those applications. We will screen them and interview accordingly, and uh, I'll make selections based on, uh, based on filling those three positions. Thank you. Further? Nothing further. Next, I have Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have some, uh, some brief number questions and a follow-up to Mr. McNeely and Mr. Thompson's points. So I was wondering, what, what's the yearly expenditures of WSCC and how much is brought in through the assessments and the, uh, the fine payments? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Grundy. So our <coughs> yearly budget, uh, to speak for 217, is approximately $34 million. Um, we bring roughly that in, um, a little bit more, uh, but that $34 million is the administrative cost for running the entire organization. Then we have the claims cost, which is up and above that, which runs about 50, I'm going to say roughly 50 to $55 million a year. We have been able to reduce that in uh, recent years through um, our return to work program that we're working with employers, and at one point we had it down to about $34 million. But it, it, it floats around between 40 and $50 million per year. Um, we get money, as you know, Mr. Simpson, through uh, employer assessments and through 
the investment of uh, the money that we have um, to offset the cost of, of doing business, and so it doesn't the, the money doesn't go back to the or the the um, it, there's no charges back to the employers to raise their rates. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I worked with a lot of construction. I know the, the value of safety. And I think it's good to get into the schools because the last person you're going to get to put their hard hat on is someone who's been a carpenter for 40 years. So it's good to get the people young. Um, I, I, what, I guess what, what's the total staff of uh, WSCC and how many, what's the division of that? I know most people are in, Yell, are in Yellowknife, and I think you said there's two in Inuvik. Right. Um, what, what's the total staff? and? The Inuvik model, is, why isn't that rolled out in other regional centers? I mean, in Hay River, it would seem like it would be great to have a, a couple people there because that uh, the OHS officer, when they come down to the community, they're very helpful and, and people really appreciate their, you know, working with them. But it, it, it's a lot of work for a, a small business to, to comply with all these regulations. I mean, safety is an industry in of itself now. And uh, it seems like it would make sense and reduce, you know, workplace injuries, keep everyone safer. If there was safety officers in the community that could go and, and on a regular basis work with organizations or work with businesses and provide training for, uh, for, for workers and for employers. So I guess the question was, how, how many employers are there and when, uh, when are you going to start staffing them in Hay River? How many employees? Employees, employees of WSCC. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Grenny. There are 135 employees in the Northwest Territories of Nunavut, 25 of which are in um, Nunavut. Uh, and two which are in Anuvik. Um, we're, we had an office in Rankin <coughs> that we, although not applicable to the to this committee, um, all employees of the WSCC, regardless of where you live, are employees of the public service uh, of the GNWT. So uh, we closed the office in Anuvik because number one, we couldn't get anybody to go there. Uh, number two, uh, when we did have a person there, we could only get one person there and um, it became safety concerns of having a single officer in, in a community by themselves with no, with no assistance or anything like that. The, um, we do look at, uh, we have looked at the Hay River model before. All our safety officers are, um, are assigned different regions, different communities, and they have to be in that region or community at least a minimum of one week a month. Most are there usually two weeks of the month. So it, it boils down to dollars and cents, and it boils down to, ease of accessibility to a community. Hay River is easily accessible from here. Um, I'm not suggesting we shouldn't have an office there. I'm just suggesting at the present time, um, ease of accessibility, um, how much um, activity there is in that area, um, meaning construction and, and businesses and, and things like that. Thank you. Further, Minister Abernathy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And he, uh, Mr. Grundy said in Nuvik, but I'm pretty sure he is referring to Rankin Inlet, just for the record. Yeah. Uh, and, and ultimately, um, staff complement and where they're allocated, that's, that's something that the, the president and the, the WSCC would present to the governance council who would make informed decisions. Every decision has the ability to drive rates. And in addition to providing safety, we're also providing compensation. And the, the goal is to keep rates for employers as low as possible uh, because it can be a burden. So every decision they're making is taken in into, into consideration dollars and cents and how do we keep costs low. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Hay River is accessible, but if someone's in Hay River, well, now they can get to Port Rezies, they can get to Smith, they can get to Providence. They can, uh, they, they have that whole circuit accessible. And uh, in terms of rates, uh, it's not much to set someone up in Hay River, really. I mean, they're just renting, renting an office in Hay River, but uh, I think it comes down to increased safety. Rates will go down for, for employers because there's someone there to help them with their, uh, their, their safety programs and increase safety. And, to, you know, once you reach a certain size, you basically need a full-time safety officer, which is up to a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, an expense for business for someone who really doesn't add to, add to the money coming in. Right? And so I think that there's a, much like the strategic investments uh, that are being discussed in this budget, I think that's a strategic investment to help lower costs in the long run. So I guess that's more of a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Comment noted to the comment, uh, Minister Abernathy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Technically, I'm supposed to be in a government house leader meeting with, uh, with, uh, with Minister, or the chair of PMP, but 
to that point, I think we, we do hear you, and I think there's definitely value in the in the Governance Council and the WSCC looking at the, the cost-benefit analysis of exactly what the member's talking about uh, and looking at the possibility of some level of decentralization, recognizing at the end of the day we also need to look at the dollars and cents and make sure that what the member's referring is actually plausible. And I, I, we have a Governance Council consisting of employers, employees, and the President who, who will do their due diligence on that particular area. Thank you. Further. Further? Next I have Mr. McNeely in the interest of time. Gonna watch. Thank you, Mr. Someone's Chair. Gotta go. in, in the interest of time in the interest of the time it's only a comment here. Through the experience I had in Toledo there in twenty eleven in preparation for industry activity that's going on. And I'm glad to hear you had mentioned uh, classroom activities here to minimizing your costs of claims through uh, through safety awareness and uh, engaging the school is good. It's positive. At the time, the you know, community of Toledo is very small. We uh, solicited some government funds and uh, sponsored out these minimized course, courses, including safety there. And uh, we went into the school and uh, done the teachers and the principals there as well. So it, it was really good value for, for the community. So I, I really, uh, really take uh, what your suggestion uh, as a good one. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Comment. Comment noted. And yeah, we are out of time to take this opportunity to allow the minister any final comments. Minister Abernathy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just once again, thanks for the opportunity to come and talk about the WSCC and how it uh, how it operates here in the Northwest Territories, with particular focus on its goals of uh, safety as well as compensation. Uh, if you have any additional questions, please send us up to the writing. We'll make sure we, we get back to, to, to you in committee. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you to everybody for coming and presenting today. Very much appreciate it. Thank you. I'll ask the committee to just sit tight for just one moment, and then we'll – that's it. Thank you.